this episode, I had um, the privilege to meet Professor Hermann Simon, who is the honorary chairman and founder of Simon Kusher, a leading uh, expert in pricing and also considered uh, the pricing man. We had a conversation on learning on how you can develop your skill related to pricing, but also some current issues related to pricing that we can see now. He is um, he has written um, many books on pricing, uh, and the, the latest one being price management and beating inflation. And he continues to provide wisdom in his uh, talks and also books that he is currently uh, writing. As I said, he co-founded um, Simon Kusher who is uh, uh, present in uh, 31 countries and has offices, more than 47 offices. And in 2022, the revenue of Simon Kusher was $565 million. So I hope uh, you'll uh, get the most out of this interview and you can find more from Professor Simon about the current trends related to pricing and why not learning. Yeah. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, it's an honor for me to have in this uh, Ingredients for Learning podcast, Professor Herman Simon. Hello, Professor Herman. Hello, Kostin Siora. <laughs> how are you and uh, how are things with uh, related to the book launch that we had uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago? I was very impressed by the interest uh, at the, the event in the bookstore. And I found our discussion also inspiring. And in the meantime, I have had couple, a couple of interviews with uh, Romanian journalists. So the interest in pricing seems to be strong. And I look forward uh, to a good uh, running book. Yeah, great, great. So first of all, uh, I want to point out uh, the confessions of the pricing man, how price affects everything. Uh, a very um, comprehensive book that you can find in English. For those interested, uh, I will also add the Amazon link uh, in the in the uh, podcast notes. And also we have uh, the Romanian uh, adaptation and translation of the book. I'm, I was really honored to be part in this project, and I had uh, uh, very uh, uh, a lot of things to learn from Professor Simon. Uh, and I will also post um, the link. Can to you pronounce the, the Romanian? title so that yes. i hear it and pronounce it correctly when i try to to repeat yes. that confessionle un om de pricing uh, yeah that <laughs> i would even understand in romanian <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. so as you see it's also a very nice cover so i will post the link there yeah so, it's a very well done nice book yeah, so Professor Simon, I was impressed uh, since the first time I, I read your book um, uh, on, on, of course, um, the how you began studying pricing. And I think it will be very interesting. Uh, of course, those that will want to hear more and read more will uh, have the possibility to do that in the book. Um, but this is a podcast about learning and how you can better develop and how you can improve towards becoming an expert. So I'm I'm really curious. Maybe you can share a couple of things related to the beginning of you know the pricing man because this is how you're known now, the global expert on pricing. Yeah, there are two uh, important starting points. One, I grew up on a small farm. And uh, my father was all the time confronted with prices mm -hmm. for uh, pigs, for milk, or whatever we, we sold in agricultural products and produce. And um, he had almost no influence on the price because these prices uh, were determined by supply and demand. So when we went to the market with our pigs, um, the price was uh, determined by the by the market organizer and you had no influence. And I don't honestly remember whether I understood that at that time, but at least later on, I came to the conclusion that I should not be in a business where you have no influence on your prices. <laughs> and the second uh, starting point or uh, fork road was uh, when I had to select my uh, dissertation topic. And uh, that was um, 
pricing strategies for new products. So I started to approach pricing, to understand pricing from the scientific side and perspective and uh, wrote uh, this doctoral dissertation, which was also published as a book in, in German. Mm -hmm. And that was my first, say, professional deeper encounter with pricing. And you, I, I may um, name a third point. In 1979, I visited the famous marketing professor, Philip Kotler at Northwestern University. And I told him, I am doing research on pricing. I would like to have an impact on practice. And he said, every academic researcher wants to have an impact on practice, but hardly anybody achieves that. But then he said, I know one person in Chicago who calls himself price consultant. Mm -hmm. And I thought, can you make a living living from price consulting? And then that may have been the seed for founding Simon Kutschau uh, and partners, uh, our, our consulting company were just focused on pricing and the number one in the world in, in, in price consulting. So these were starting points, foundations of my, my work in the ensuing decades. Okay. And so you, you met Professor Kotler and that was basically a time when you were also, you, you were involved in academia, basically. Yes, uh, at, uh, that was during a year when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And being in the United States, I took advantage of uh, being able to visit famous uh, marketing universities, marketing professors. And Philip Kotler received me, which was unusual for such an unknown guy like me. And he was very friendly. And until today, we have a very close uh, friendship and relationship. Okay. So, and step by step, you, you realize that pricing is something not only to study, but also to, as you said, uh, you can make a living out of it. And uh, I, I'm curious, what was, from uh, your point of view at that time, you know, switching and moving towards more business related activities and uh, i'm 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 interested in also uh, many of the viewers are uh, those those that are at the beginning of their career or maybe they are first time manager they are thinking of this type of decisions which are really important but on the other side they've tried to figure it out what is their passion you you figured it out very quickly that you you wanted to study pricing and you do, did that in academia and then you you founded Simon Kusher which uh, is now in in more than 47 countries right we have 48 offices 40, yeah, okay. in 31 countries in 31. some countries we have like the US and China we have several offices or in Germany yeah um, it was not a fast development um I started my doctoral dissertation, which I just described in 1973. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I went more and more into empirical research where I re looked at real world data, which was not the case in this field before. Mm -hmm. And um, then I became professor. So I pursued, a, you could say, a classic academic career. Yeah. And uh, we have assistants in Germany who write doctoral dissertations, and I gave them also topics which were very practically relevant. Just one example, which Dr. Kucher, uh, my first doctoral student, worked on, was using scanner data, which were just introduced around 1980 mm -hmm. to measure price elasticities before that you didn't have information on prices and volumes of articles sold in a supermarket now with scanner data you had all this information and so he was able to write a very uh, practically relevant um, dissertation could measure price elasticities also the de developments the dynamics of, of price elasticity and publishing some of these results led to requests from companies when we were still in the university. Mm -hmm. Could you help us? We did some small projects. Uh, also where students worked on projects uh, 
out of the university. Mm -hmm. And in, in the mid 80s, we said, if we want to offer a professional consulting service, we have to set up a company outside the university. Mm -hmm. And that became uh, Simon Kutcher and Partners. So the name of my first doctorate student who was a co-founder is um, in the company name. And I left the university 10 years later in 1995, gave up my professorship at, the, at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz and uh, became full-time CEO of Simon Kutcher. Then we started to internationalize. Uh, we opened our first foreign office in 1996 in Boston. I will actually be tomorrow in Boston <laughs> again. Nice. And um, so it started. And today we have 2,200 employees and as I said, 48 offices. Of course, we did not expect that uh, at that time. Yeah. So, uh, it, and you started this um, very interesting career in pricing. And of course, um, there, there are a lot of things that you see now connecting the dots with, uh, since you started with academia and then in consulting. Um, and I'm, I'm always um, interested to see and to, to understand more uh, about how you see it and what what views you have on various topics related to that. And uh, I was thinking, what do you see now as some trends related to pricing that might be relevant also even after that, right? For those that want more to to study the book, uh, to take it for for me is like, you know, you it, it's a book that must be studied and uh, both by, those that are in this field, but also for by non-finance people that will learn a lot of things related to business and how, right, how the, this economic and business machine works. Yeah. What, what trends do you see now relevant? There, there are, say, two worlds of pricing. So, mm -hmm. the, uh, the classical work, uh, world is we have three determinants of the optimal price, mm -hmm. cost, value to customer and competition. Mm -hmm. And when you look back 30, 40 years, practically the only determinant was cost and people applied cost plus pricing because they didn't have the data to uh, quantify the value to customer. Yeah. They also did not have the same um, information on as competitive on competitive prices as today today you can look every, up everything in the uh, internet you get comparisons yeah. etc so yeah. the whole information scene has totally changed but more difficult uh, was to convince managers and entrepreneurs that value to customer is the most important determinant and not cost mm -hmm. and uh, there people still feel uncertain now to the modern world. In the last 20 years, we have seen more innovations in pricing than in the 2000 years before. An interesting example is the sharing economy. Yeah. The Greek philosopher Socrates said 2,500 years ago, the value of a product does not ori originate from the ownership, but from the actual use of the product, what we call value in use today. So you don't have to own a car, a scooter, or whatever it is, but you, will you want to be able to use it when you need it. Yeah. So this idea of Socrates was the mother of the sharing economy. But why was this idea not implemented before? Because it was impossible. Think of a scooter, an electric scooter, which costs 1,000 euros. If you sell it in the old transaction model, you have one transaction. Yeah. If you rent it by the minute, you have thousands of transactions at minimum amounts and you have to uh, to run these transactions at, at at marginal cost of practically zero so only the internet made the sharing economy possible another aspect is you have to bring huge numbers of 
supply this kind of, of, of scooters and uh, people who, who use them together also only available with the internet. And we have so many innovations. Uh, this is one sharing economy and paying by the minute or the hour or the distance. Uh, freemium where you have part of the offering is free and for the premium version you pay we have flat rates we have pay per use uh, both in consumer as in industrial fields for instance um, michelin the global leader in tires for the, i'm not talking of truck and bus tires they have a system where they do not sell the as a tire but uh, rent them um, by the kilometer driven so you have all these innovations and uh, dynamic pricing, of course, and, and people, we, everybody else is just learning yeah. to apply, to optimize, to take advantage of these possibilities. And of course, in, a new player in the game is now artificial intelligence. Uh, we apply artificial intelligence and uh, there are some interesting findings. Let me just give you an example. Uh, it was for an American uh, retail chain. Um, they they uh, cut the prices before closing in the evening of perishable goods like for bread or, or fruits, etc. And they found that the reaction to this kind of dynamic pricing differs very strongly between various cities that had no explanation for this. Mm -hmm. So we threw, threw all available data into an artificial intelligence system. And one finding was, if there is a lot of construction work going on, road construction, road renovations in a city, these dynamic pricing offers and price cuts do not work. Mm -hmm. That's intelligible because if people think they are in a traffic jam, there are roadblocks, etc. They don't go in the evening to the store. Yeah. You, yeah. you would never have found that out with, with manual work. Hmm. Okay. So now it means, does it mean that even this space of um, pricing, revenue management analysis uh, has reached a, a new peak in terms of the possibilities, right? Because you have artificial intelligence that can um, highlight some trends that you never thought of, maybe with the amount of data. Yes, of course. I mean, our our growth from from zero, uh, practically uh, 30, 30, 7, 30, 8 years ago to now, uh, last year we had 535 million euros in revenue is driven by these developments. Uh, the consult price consulting as an industry did not exist in the, uh, in the 1980s. And we were the pioneer. And I think that partially explains our, our growth and, and success. And I still think today that we are the, the best in this field without uh, boosting. And I'm I'm thinking now, of course, uh, on one side, we have this trend of um, uh, digital transformation that will, will provide more insights, more data. On the other side, we have also um, challenges like uh, pollution, sustainability. So the customers and the new generation more interested in, in seeing that uh, companies really provide value. Um, could this shape even pricing strategies like uh, the fact that you know uh, you'll have maybe even price premium for some products just because they target a certain audience that is interested in uh, for instance yeah of course these um, new attributes like sustainability recyclability uh, under which conditions are the products made uh, is it sure that there's no uh, child work included yeah they gain in importance they are potential value drivers yeah and uh, practically today in every every project we have sustainability is an is an issue yeah. and we have to find out what is the perceived value of the customer yeah. 
Yeah. Is the customer willing to pay more? Or does the customer, if the price is more or less equal, buy more of the sustainable product, which would be another way of uh, extracting value? And uh, this is a, a big question for everybody, even before the investment phase. Say uh, we, we change the material of a product to a more environmentally uh, friendly alternative, which may be more expensive. Do we get that back? in terms of higher price or higher volume, higher market share. These are core questions our, of our projects today. And of course, people, our managers are uncertain how to assess the value because it's, it's new. They don't have experience. We can also learn and draw from the experience across industries where we have industries who are ahead Others who are lagging behind, and we can say the experiences from these industries are as follows, etc. Yeah, and I'm I'm referring now to because we have high inflation, uh, at least in Romania. What I notice, and that's also through some data that I found, uh, is the focus of retailers, for instance, for um private label their own label right promoting their label why because it's cheaper uh, as a product and we are still below the um, average at the european level in terms of how much as a weight in the total revenues the private label have and i want to give you so this is one example and another example we have a, a, a coffee a chain of coffee shops in Romania, they, they have more than 400, so very successful. Mm -hmm. And they started like seven, eight years ago under the brand Five to Go. Five, it was actually the price. All their prices was five uh, Romanian leo, which is the non, yeah. Yeah. which is the equivalent of one euro. Yeah. And they initially, it was, was very interesting. They start, all the products were the, the same price and they, they increased the diversity in order to have higher margin. But it became successful with this approach on pricing, but then they provided value. And now they are a popular brand, even though the prices are not five anymore. So what's your view on you know, this connection between uh, first of all, we have inflation, we have uh, focus on pricing, but on the other side, we have successful companies that manage to find the balance between the two and provide very interesting brands. Yeah, these are, of course, very strong messages, five to go, or the, uh, in history, we have seen many uh, stores yeah. usually coming from the US, uh, one, one dollar store or things yeah, where yeah. everything was one dollar or less. Uh, Aldi and Lidl, their, you could say, initial strategy is all so based on this clear, pronounced price advantage. Mm -hmm. Of course, when inflation comes, costs go up, uh, the slogan is endangered. But obviously, the five to go, they have established such a strong image and reputation and preferences on side of their customers that they can afford to raise the price now to six, seven, or eight, or whatever it is. But very often this doesn't work. If, if uh, a certain price threshold uh, has to be broken, that can be difficult. What we see a lot, uh, amazingly often, is what we call shrink inflation, that they reduce the package size, the weight, in order to stay below the price threshold, but that you can only do once. You cannot do it repeatedly because then you approach uh, zero in the volume. So this is a, a, a very tricky, a strong message to enter market. But if costs increase, in inflation comes, uh, it can be really, really challenging and, and difficult. Yeah. And uh, related to so increase, there's five to go yeah. would make a nice case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they they expanded now. They have uh, coffee shops also in in Europe, so they created this. So, Professor under the Simon same Simon, name, five to go everywhere. 
Yeah, and uh, but now it became like a brand. Uh, I, I'm not sure I saw it in Budapest. I don't know how they are targeting. Uh, I I don't think it's the same price. It is not. It's yeah, not because five you have euro. different in in Hungary. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. different currency. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, Professor Simon, because uh, we are approaching the end of our uh, uh, conversation, um, I would like to invite you to to share some some views related to, for instance potential students that are interested in exploring more, for instance, uh, on the pricing. What what do you see? Uh, uh, because still, whenever I, I work and I have uh, uh, also this hat of being in academia and I'm working with students, whenever is they, they look at pricing, uh, they are sometimes scared. Some of them, for instance, I'm teaching at a master program in entrepreneurship. They have also their own businesses. And they are uh, sometimes uh, um, scared to position the price. They are uh, thinking about the competition, but on the other side, they have high cost. What would be for them, but also for entrepreneurs and also um, people interested in this topic, relevant to know about pricing as a conclusion to our conversation? Pricing in the curriculum is not considered sexy. <laughs> People think it's very theoretic, quantitative. Yeah. Advertising is so much more interesting, colorful, and better. And I, just as an example, I choose a different way. Nobody was writing a dissertation on pricing at that time. Everybody uh, was market segmentation, marketing, uh, advertising. And uh, I was once in the Harvard bookstore in, in Boston and there was a shelf on advertising two meters. Mm. <laughs> and the shelf on pricing was three books. Wow. <laughs> so this is a niche with a great opportunity. And um, somebody said about this book, this confessions book, the first book on pricing, which is not boring. <laughs> yeah. And I can assure you, also from my more than 2,000 associates in Simon Kutcher, it's a fascinating area and it's very, very important for companies. Great. Professor Simon, thank you very much for, for joining this podcast and looking forward to hear you again with all your... I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Costin Until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.